improve your immune system. <laughs> and by no means do I mean if you follow all these things, you're never going to get sick. Sometimes we just get sick. But if you get sick, we want you to recover as quick as possible. So we're going to give you some good hard science, some good hard physiology, and all these things are super simple. It's not going to cost you a ton of extra money. Um, just What's that? She's talking smash. You say you sure? <laughs> no, I said no sugar. I read that. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, we'll get to that. So, what makes us sick, guys? Um, whether it's an acute illness, whether it's a chronic illness, a lot of us like to blame it on our genes, right? We like to blame it on our moms or our dads. Especially when we look at chronic illness, 99% of the issues that we see out there are not related to our genes. They're related to our lifestyle, okay? So we cannot blame it on our genes. We can't blame it on bad germs either, okay? Um, the germ theory of disease states that we get sick because of germs. We come into con contact with a germ and it makes us sick. However, if that were the case and every germ made us sick, we wouldn't have a species anymore, okay? So it's not just the germs that are making us sick. There's literally, there's thousands of germs in this room right now, not to freak any of you out. Um, everywhere. But, but there is, everywhere. And remember that experiment that we all did either in high school or college or even grad school, where you take a swab of like a door handle or a moat or something and then you put it in a Petri dish? You guys haven't done that? There's some cool stuff that grows I've seen in there. On TV, yeah, there's cool the stuff that grows bottles, in there. Cell phones. And, yeah, yeah, there's a ton of germs there. Um, but yet we're not always sick, okay? So we cannot blame it on our germs. And in fact, you've got to come in contact with those germs to develop a robust immune system. It's not bad luck either, and we need to stop blaming it on everybody else. So when somebody comes in sick to the clinic, they'll say, my kids got me sick, my husband got me sick, but in all reality, it's their fault, okay? It's the things that you've been doing, and that's why you're, you're sick. So what we like to say is you don't get sick, you do sick. Okay, whether it was the past couple weeks, you haven't been living like you usually live and it made you a little more susceptible, or maybe you're always sick and you're always just doing sick, so that's why you get sick. So what we're going to go over um, and how we're going to prepare and train your immune system is, like I said, super simple principles. But as practitioners, we find if you guys actually understand why we recommend what we recommend, then you're more likely to do it. But if I just tell you to not eat sugar, you're just going to blow it off. So, no sugar, and there's a ton of science behind that. we got to drink plenty of water. We want to get a lot of adequate rest, extra adjustments, and I'll spend a little extra time on that, and there's a lot of science, a lot of physiology involved in that, so I'll try and break it down super simple. We want to eat simple, nutritious foods, take a few needed supplements, and this isn't complicated. People really like to complicate the supplements, and in fact, I feel like we got kind of a supplement issue in the United States too, not just a drug issue. Um, we've seemed to um, made the replacement of instead of taking a drug for every ailment, that we're just going to take a supplement for every ailment. And it's got to be a little simpler than that. The other thing is don't interfere. Let the body just do what it was designed to do. It's very, very intelligent. So sugar. How many people know that sugar cripples your immune system? How many people remember how many pounds of sugar we consumed a year? It was way too much. Yeah. You don't remember the number? It was like 160, wasn't it? 165, yeah. somewhere between 150 and 170 is the typical American. A year, pounds of sugar a year. Yeah, so that's, that just... that's crazy. Now, how many people know that vitamin C is important in an immune response? Right? When we were little, our moms told us to take a bunch of vitamin C when we got sick. There's, there's a good rationale behind that, but I'm going to tell you the problem is that that we need more vitamin C is that we need less sugar. In fact, we are the only mammals um, that can't produce vitamin C on our own. So we don't see tigers eating oranges, and we don't see a pack of wolves trying to you know, attack an orange tree. Um, they actually produce it on their own, but we require it, and it needs to be available to us, okay? And that's where sugar comes in, is it decreases our availability of vitamin C. Vitamin C is very, very important in an immune response called phagocytosis. So I want you to picture these little immune cells called phagocytes, and they act like Pac-Man, okay? So they're going to gobble up bacteria and viruses and other pathogens, and then carry them out of the body. In order to have that process take place, we have got to have vitamin C. However, in the body, um, 
Our bodies do not know the difference between glucose, that simple sugar that we use for energy, and vitamin C. Because their molecular composition is super, super similar. They're almost identical. So they use the same receptors. So in order for vitamin C to get into a cell, it has to use the exact same receptors glucose does to get into a cell. So if we have a ton of circulating sugar and glucose in our bloodstream, we're not going to um, have the receptors available for vitamin C. The body always has a higher affinity for glucose over vitamin C. So if there's a ton of glucose and the body has a greater affinity for that, we're not going to get vitamin C into the cell and we're going to miss out on this phagocytic activity. Okay, so it's really going to dampen down our immune response. So, one thing we might notice is people with diabetes, they do have a um, dampered immune response, and it's because of this. The other thing is sugar can really feed an infection, especially when we're talking about fungal infections. So sugar can really promote um, candida and a yeast overgrowth. So a lot of times, people that consume a ton of sugar might struggle with things like yeast infections. Sugar is also really, really pro-inflammatory, okay, which is going to knock down our immune system and it's going to put us at greater risk for every disease under the sun. It also stimulates a stress response. So when we eat sugar, we release this hormone called insulin. When we release insulin, we stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, okay? So we have two divisions of the autonomic nervous system. One is focused on resting and repairing. It's called the parasympathetic. And the other is the sympathetic, so it's our fight or flight. So when our ancestors were running from a tiger or fighting a pack of wolves, this was the, the system you know, that is activated. Unfortunately, we don't know the difference between that now and road rage. You know? So we're, we're stimulating this in that situation too. The point is, when we stimulate this sympathetic nervous system, we're going to release the um, stress hormone cortisol, right? Cortisol is going to decrease our cell-mediated immunity, which is our immediate response to something. So just by eating sugar, we cause this entire cascade that's going to dampen down our immune response. Simple, right? A little complicated. To understand. <laughs> water. We all know that water is important, but why? Um, every single cell in our body requires water. We are literally just like a swimming pool of cells. They require that aqueous environment. They require it for communication back and forth um, and to let things in and out of the cell. When we do not consume enough water, or let's say we're dehydrated, it actually promotes histamine production. So histamine is very, very important if I get stung by a bee, um, but if we're producing it all the time, it's going to uh, cause low-grade chronic inflammation, which is going to dampen down our immune response. So, for example, if I get stung by a bee, we release this chemical, um, and what it does is it dilates our vessels. So it makes them bigger, and it also makes them more permeable, so they get kind of leaky. So we can actually send immune cells through those blood vessels out to the tissues that just got venom injected in them. So in that situation, it's important. When we're chronically releasing this histamine and causing a bunch of inflammation, we're going to run into problems. What we recommend in here, because there's a ton of controversy on how much water we should actually drink, we want you to drink half of your body weight in ounces. So if you weigh 300 pounds, uh, you should drink uh, 150 ounces of water. 75 ounces of that should come from our food and 75 ounces of that should come from water, okay? So when we're eating vegetables and fruit, there's a lot of water in those, okay? And we need to be consuming, like Heather said, we need to consume more vegetables than fruit because fruit does contain sugar. It does come with a lot of other nutrients, but, you know, if we're eating only fruits, it's going to do the same thing as eating that refined sugar, okay? So limit the fruits when we're sick. Really focus on the veggies. When we drink water, we need to make sure that it's filtered, okay? Does anybody here know um, why we chlorinate our water? China does chlorinate our to water. To get rid of bacteria? Exactly. So, like Heather said, when we have these antibiotics or we chlorinate something, they aren't like smart bombs. They don't just kill the bad bacteria. They kill all the good stuff, too. So if we're drinking that water, it's going to disrupt our... our um, uh, microbiota is going to disrupt our good gut flora. Don't they put fluoride in the water too? Here oh, they don't. Cheyenne? They don't okay. in Cheyenne. Oh, that's good. 
I know that so, I'm talking about it up in Sheridan where my cousin lives. She's really mad about that. And yeah. she should be. And the only way to get rid of that would be like reverse osmosis, like the calling in. They can actually do that because they change the pH. But like a simple solid carbon block filter will get rid of the chlorination in your home. So in our house, we actually we have filters on our showers. We have filters for our drinking water as well. It's built in because we don't want to be consuming this chlorine and we don't want that on our skin either. I got to give a little plug here because as a health and wellness expert, we got to be environmentalists too because we're only as healthy as our planet. So if our air isn't good quality and our water source isn't good quality and we keep depleting our soil, we're not going to have good things to eat or drink, okay? We're not going to be here very long. So I encourage all of you to not use those plastic throwaway bottles. Invest in a good glass bottle or a stainless steel bottle. Um, the other thing is these throwaway bottles are going to end up in a landfill and hopefully they get recycled. If they don't, they're going to end up in the landfill, on the side of the road, or in the ocean. In fact, there's mounds of trash in the ocean the size of states. That's scary. Yeah, it's disgusting and then we wonder why um, some of our food supply, like our fish, is tainted with different chemicals. Time out. So. They have a really cool new thing at Fitness One now at the new gym that's a fill up bottle instead of like a spout like a water fountain and it counts how many plastic water bottles they've saved by just like people refilling their bottles. That's all over you doing at the airports too. Yeah. They do. It's cool. Yeah. So here's the thing, we eventually will have stainless steel bottles in here and we will give you one just so you need to get rid of these. Okay. <laughs> The other thing, water is super important in temperature regulation. Temperature is really important when we're sick, right? And oftentimes we'll spike a fever or have a fever when we're sick. And we regulate this temperature. We can hold that temperature better if we're well hydrated. Um, water is also important. It's important for all of our cells, like I said. The skin and the mucous membranes are no exception. So when we're talking about the immune system, our very first line of defense is our skin. So we have a physical barrier to certain things. Our skin actually secretes fatty acids and it secretes different enzymes that can break things down. If we don't have the water and we have that dry, cracked skin, we're not going to be secreting those things. Now, if a bacteria or virus gets around the skin and let's say goes in our nose or our mouth, then we have our mucous membranes. Um, and they secrete antibody, anti antibodies as well as um, enzymes also to break those things down. So in the winter months, we often see that people get sick more often. One of the contributing factors to that is not only the increase in sugar because of all the holidays, um, but we turn on that forced hot air, right? So it dries out our skin, it dries out our mucous membranes, and it allows things to enter the body a little bit more easily. So mucus is super important also because it forms a physical barrier. It's really thick, it's viscous. And it can also trap things and then we expel them forcefully, like a sneeze or a cough. Those things are important. I didn't think mucus was that cool, did you? <laughs> mucus is pretty cool, okay? Let the boogers and loogies fly. All right. So we got to we gotta rest, too. All, all of our moms when we were little, they told us get a rest, but why? And it's all about energy delegation, okay? Temperature is really important when we're sick, and like I said, oftentimes it helps us with our immune response. 83% of our energy is used just to maintain our body temperature. The other 17% has to be divided along those other systems. So we have an immune system, a digestive system, system a hormonal system. When we are sick, we want to you know, delegate as much energy as we possibly can to this immune system. So oftentimes when we're sick, what happens? We get tired, we get achy, we're lethargic, we might get the chills, um, and that's our body telling us to cover up, get horizontal, get some sleep. This is the only time, and that you will tell me, that, or excuse me, this is the only time you will hear me tell you to postpone a workout. It's when you're fighting an acute infection. Okay, and the reason is, is we need to delegate as much energy to the immune system as we possibly can. We do not need to be using energy on our musculoskeletal system when we're trying to fight off an infection, okay? So workouts are good. We should work out every single day that we eat. Um, but when we're fighting an infection, postpone that workout. Same reason why we need to decrease mental stress, okay? This mental stress, it'll, it'll actually uh, stimulate the exact same stress response that I talked about with sugar, so it's gonna dampen our immune system. 
But literally, all of us are way too maxed out, okay? We're literally like one of those power strips. And eventually, you know, we're going to come to the point where we have to plug so many things in, we're going to have to yank the plug on the immune system, and we're going to get sick. So when we get sick, hopefully you're in a profession or a job where you can call in and actually get some rest, get, some, get horizontal and get wet. And we need to stay warm, right? Temperature is super duper important when we're fighting off an infection and we don't want to have to delegate any more energy to that system than we have to because we want as much going to the immune system. So the old wife's tale of going outside with your head wet or not wearing a coat um, is actually true, but it has nothing to do with catching a cold or catching a bug. It has everything to do with compromising your immune system because you have to delegate more energy to staying warm as opposed to actual immune function. All right, this is going to get a little dicey here, okay? <laughs> so I had this really good explanation for you guys, and I told Heather, and she said, you lost me. So if it I lost it to a chiropractor, then we need to make it more simple. <laughs> so whenever you're sick, we want you to get extra adjustments. There's nothing that pees me off more than when somebody calls in sick for an adjustment. Um, because it's going to help you fight that thing off. It's going to help you boost your immune system. And if you end up... If we end up getting sick, that's our fault. That means we were doing sick, right? So you never have to worry about getting near Heather or our staff sick. So, like Heather talked, <laughs> subluxation is a misalignment of a spinal bone, okay? So we have a misalignment of two bones. What this does is it damages the tissue around the spine, and it results in a lot of swelling and inflammation, just like a sprained ankle. This swelling and inflammation results in a fixation. So now we got this bone that is misaligned, <laughs> swollen, and it's stuck. Okay, so that's going to result in nerve irritation and obviously we have a loss of function within that joint. This normal healthy motion in the spine is super important for brain stimulation and nutrition. So you've probably heard us both say that 90% of stimulation and nutrition to the brain actually comes from movement of our spine. Okay, and unfortunately we lose out on, on a lot of that because we all sit too much. So that movement is very important. When we're sick, we need to activate that parasympathetic nervous system, okay? So that rest and repair division of our nervous system. That's where we're going to have um, the greatest function of that immune system. So when we are subluxated, what happens is we have, we have uh, two different receptors within the spinal joints that I want you to know about. We have nociceptors, which are responsible for picking up noxious stimuli, like pain. Okay? We have proprioceptors, which just you know, pick up movement, so we know where our body is in space. I always know where my hand is, I always know where my arm is or my foot is, and that's a result of those proprioceptors which in those, those joints. The spine is very rich in those. When we are subluxated and we have that misalignment and that fixation, what happens is we have an increase in nociception, so an increase in noxious stimuli. What that's going to do is it's literally going to act like static to the brain. Okay, and we also have a decrease in that important proprioception. Okay, the end result is we're going to have an increase in the sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight response, which is going to trigger a cascade of cortisol production, the stress hormone, and a decreased immune response. So I know there's some heavy, heavy science behind that, and some heavy physiology that might be hard to understand, but in the long and haul of it, being subluxated is going to stimulate this sympathetic nervous system, cortisol production, and a decreased immune response. When we are subluxated, um, it's also an inflammatory condition. Okay, So by removing that subluxation and adjusting you, we're decreasing pro-inflammatory markers. And the research on this is really, really cool. We can actually see that in people's blood work. Um, and we also increase the immune response. Uh, when we adjust you because we see a increase in phagocytic activity. So we talked about how that was important with vitamin C and sugar. When we adjust your spine, we actually see a little cellular burst of those phagocytes. And we can also see an improvement in our IgG, IgM, and T cell production, which are all immune cells. And where they do the majority of this research is with um, cancer patients and AIDS patients. So these are some of the most immunocompromised people, and they're seeing really cool changes like this with just giving a specific adjustment to the spine, getting things mobilized again, getting things in their normal alignment, and decreasing that inflammation. So super cool. Never call in sick to an adjustment um, when you're not feeling good. 
And in fact, I'd encourage you to get checked more during that week that you're trying to fight something off. If I'm fighting something off or Heather's fighting something off, oftentimes I'll get checked twice in one day. So, all right, we need to eat simple and nutritious food. So what's that mean? It really means, um, for the most part, plants. Okay, so we need to be eating vegetables and we need to be eating fruits. These contain all the vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients um, and phytochemicals and enzymes that are important in a proper immune function, okay? And we always want to consume more vegetables than fruits. Fruits are good, but they do contain a lot of sugar, okay? That's going to get broken down just like glucose in the blood. And we don't want to inhibit that, that vitamin C from doing its job. The other thing that I really like is broths. Okay? Not everybody knows how to make their own bone broth. Super simple. We can always give you a recipe. My favorite is bone broth. It's light. It's soothing. It has gelatin in it, which is very good in promoting gut health and healing the gut. It has collagen, which is in every single tissue in our body and super important for healing. It has vitamins, minerals, and important amino acid called glycine that is anti-inflammatory. Vegetable broth is also good. You're just going to miss out on the gelatin, collagen, and glycine. But also very light. does have a lot of good nutrients in it. Light on the meats when we're sick, okay? Um, I am a huge proponent of eating humanely raised, grass-fed, grass-finished, non-antibiotic, non-steroid um, meats, okay? But the typical American eats way too much meat. Okay, we shouldn't be eating, <clears throat> eating meat with every single meal. We should be taking a break from it. And one of the times that we definitely need to take a break from eating meat is when we're sick. Okay, it's really metabolically expensive to churn up that meat and digest it. Okay, so we don't want to spend any more energy on our digestive system than we need to. Okay, so we want to eat light and we want to eat super nutritious foods when we're sick. The other, good, or the other thing I recommend is every so often, I do recommend a fast, okay, where you actually just help empty out the gut, especially if you eat a ton of meat, okay? So typically I'll fast once a week just to kind of clear out the gut, and all I'm drinking is water or a green drink or, or broth, okay? Want to give that gut a rest. As far as supplements, the way we approach supplements in here is really, really simple. If you're deficient in it and it's not in your diet, and you need it, it's required for health, then go ahead and take it. Okay, so there's three things that we always recommend, and that's an omega-3 fatty acid. Uh, the best source you can get that is from fish oil. Okay, you want to make sure that it's mercury-free and um, it, it's a pharmaceutical grade. The thing that's important with omega-3 is every single cell in our body has fats in it, okay? And they're these long chain, uh, fatty acids like EPA and DHA that you find in fish oil that are important for that cell function. The other thing is they're anti-inflammatory, okay? So you all know that reducing inflammation in that body or that low-grade chronic insidious inflammation is super important. One of the best ways is to balance out the ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s in the body and the best way is supplementing with a good omega. Probiotics, especially if you um, just had to take a round of antibiotic, antibiotics, you're going to want to double up on your probiotics. But everybody should be on a probiotic and they should be taking them daily. It's essential for gut health. And like we've pounded numerous times, 70 to 80 percent of your immune cells are actually housed within your gut, meaning your large intestine. Vitamin D. So this time of year I recommend everybody supplements with vitamin D. Um, and to be honest, this time of year I recommend at least 5,000 IUs. Vitamin D is very, very important in immune function. And our bodies can produce it, but it requires sunlight. We don't have much of that right now. And in the winter months, we don't either. So that's a, another reason why we see people getting sicker um, in those winter months, is we're literally not being exposed to sun. So, especially here in Wyoming, so we're not producing this vitamin D. Other things to take when you're fighting an acute infection would be zinc, echinacea, essential oils. Oregano oil is really, really good when you're fighting something off like that. But these should only be taken when we're in an acute illness, okay? When you need a little bit of help, uh, but should never be taken habitually. These things I recommend all the time. Um, and you should double up on them when you're sick. Here's the last thing, guys, is we need to just realize that the body is smart. 
Okay, it's not stupid. So we need to stop interfering. If our if we have a fever or our kiddo has a fever, let's just let it run its course. Okay, it's super important. It's um, it's going to, what it's going to do is it's going to increase our production of immune cells and it's going to send things out as quick as possible. So, once again, back to science class. If you wanted to increase a reaction in chemistry, what was the best way to do it? Yeah, you put it under the Bunsen burner, right? The same things apply for the, in the body, okay? So if we want to ramp up that immune system as quick as possible and efficiently as possible, we're going to ramp up our temperature too, okay? So studies show us if we actually, if we're decreasing fevers and temperatures, whether it's us or our kids, we're going to increase our illness time, okay? So suck it up. Don't just take a couple ibuprofen, pound of coffee, and get through your day. What we need to do is let the fever run its course, cover up under a blanket, and get some rest. The same thing's true for all these anti-nausea and diarrhea medications. If your body's trying to forcefully get rid of something, Let's go ahead and let it do it. Let's not just harbor whatever that is that's in there. Very smart. We're not going to throw up or have diarrhea for no reason. <clears throat> We've already talked about antibiotics, and really there is a huge problem there with superbugs. So, I mean, people do need to become more aware and not just take antibiotics with every illness that we have. And the same thing go for all these decongestants and antihistamines. Um, they might be good to decrease our inflammation, but in an acute response, that's going to be a good thing, okay? So we really need to stop interfering with the body. It's very, very smart. It's not stupid. So let's just let it do its thing. So we promise you guys, if you do the things that you should do and you do well, you're going to be well, okay? And if you do happen to get sick, um, you're going to kick it as quick as possible. So I appreciate you guys coming tonight. That's all we got for you.